We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Joanne Lamont. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what engagements he has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Joanne Lamont. Thank you. Nicola Sturgeon's department told the Audit Committee that her five biggest transport projects cost £3.3 billion. The true figure is £3.8 billion, half a billion pounds more. Why did Nicola Sturgeon mislead Parliament and the people of Scotland in this way? First Minister. Well, I, I, I think Joanne Lambert should catch up with the evidence given by the Permanent Secretary to the relevant committee yesterday. It made it quite clear uh, there was no mistakes, uh, no misleading. Uh, the question was, do you consider the cost of the project or the cost of things like buying land to prepare for a project? There are many arguments for considering the cost of a project. That shows the economic value. It shows what's actually done in building the project. What I, I think Joanne Lambert should be concentrating on is uh, the extraordinary success of the NPD programme, which is building schools, <laughs> which is building schools and hospitals and colleges around the country, particularly in the city of Glasgow, where the new Glasgow colleges are going to help revitalise further and higher education in the city. Can I assure the First Minister I did catch up with the evidence to audit committee yesterday, which was described as insulting to this Parliament. And I cannot believe that the Scottish Government thought that you could build a railway without needing to pay for the land on which it would go. <laughs> I don't know if Nicola thought you were going to build a transatlantic monorail rather than something that people were going to go on. But I think the First Minister doesn't understand why people think he's out of touch. Showing there's £500 million discrepancy, he doesn't try to explain it, he tries to explain it away. That is simply not good enough. Nicola Sturgeon seems to be running her department with the same competence she's running the Yes campaign. She missed, she missed half a billion pounds. Let me explain what that buys you. It buys you nearly 14,000 teachers. It pays for 16,000 nurses. And so the First Minister, in his world, can understand it. It buys you nigh on 1,000 trips to the Ryder Cup. <laughs> now, was Nicola Sturgeon being deliberately misleading, or is her eye off rising costs to the taxpayer because she's too busy watching the Yes campaign support going down? First Minister. Well, obviously, the, the long summer of inactivity hasn't included and improved Joanne Lamont's temper and tantor over, the, over these last few months. I, I could point out that half a billion pounds is one two hundredth of the estimated lifetime cost of the Trident missile system. <laughs> so, beloved of Labour and the Tories. I, I, and I, I, honestly, I, I know that. I know that Joanne Lamont is, is welded together in the Better Together campaign with the Conservatives, but proving as definitive proof, quoting a Conservative MSP, yes. uh, really is evidence that the rest of Scotland uh, would find rather, uh, rather tame and uh, insubstantial. Uh, the, yes. Can I put Joanne yes. Lamont? The, the £500 million pounds she points to, this is money it's spent to prepare for vital infrastructure projects. Uh, like, for example, the, the money spent on the M74 and the M80, the uh, money spent to buy the land for the peripheral route now coming uh, to the northeast of, of Scotland, money spent in, in acquiring the land for the vital hospital uh, and other projects taking place uh, around the country. Now, if the John Lamont wants to trade on capital spending, NPD replaced the private finance initiative. Yes. The private finance initiative where people ended up paying multiples of 10 for the original capital cost yeah. because of Labour Party's total inability yeah. to negotiate with private financiers to get a good yeah. deal to the public. That's why the 2.5 billion NPD programme is revitalising the capital infrastructure of Scotland in the face of punitive cuts from the Tories and Liberals in Westminster. Joanne Lamont. Well, I'm glad to see the squirrel is back refreshed after its holidays. You know, in the
a real world, charged with not being able to know where half a billion pounds is. The idea that that would be a, su a suitable response is beyond belief. Half a billion pounds you have found missing. You need to take responsibility. But of course, if in the, if in the First Minister's world... Order. Order. In the First Minister's world, that was an explanation. But if that answer was true, why has the Auditor General, Caroline Gardner, described the government figures as incomplete and inconsistent? Why was Peter Housen hauled before the Audit Committee yesterday to be dealt with by all of the parliamentarians there, not just the Chair? Was he to be a scapegoat? Because, of course, whether he's sneaking in the back way into primary schools or fetting Rupert Murdoch at Butte House, at the first sniff of trouble, the First Minister refers himself to Peter Housden, knowing he'll be cleared. And now Nicola Sturgeon, now Nicola Sturgeon gets to use Sir Peter as a human shield. You know, perhaps on the SNP benches they don't know this, but we live in an era where for too many families every penny is a prisoner, where families are putting back on supermarket shelves treats and even basic goods they used to be able to afford. How in that climate can this government get its figures wrong by half a billion pounds? First Minister. The, the half a billion pounds have been sent on things like site, site preparation. Can I just say to Jan Lamont, it can't be spent again on the list of things that she puts forward. And if she doesn't think it should be spent, then by definition she doesn't think that these project capital should projects end. should have gone ahead. And by any acknowledgement, the Non-Profit Distribution Trust is far better than the PFI paraded by the Labour Party. Even George Osborne, admittedly belatedly, has started to slate the PFI as a dreadful use of taxpayers' money. I, I don't think that Joanne Lamont should be accusing civil servants who can't answer back of, 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 of a variety of things. But can I just point out that in terms of uh, visits to Aberdeen uh, primary schools, there's been a freedom of information request which totally vindicates the position we took, just as the people of Aberdeen Donside vindicated the SNP in the by-election. Joanne Lovett. The First Minister is not in good land when he talks about civil servants being unable to defend themselves, because of course this is the First Minister who gave us the most accurate answer ever given to any parliament, had to come back at five o'clock and blame, bravely blame the civil servants for making a mistake. This is about ministerial accountability and responsibility, not about scapegoating civil servants. And of course, over the summer, Alex Salmond promised every Scot, every Scot, a £300,000 North Sea dividend after separation. Now we know his figures have a half billion pounds margin of error. <laughs> Presiding officer, here is why this matters and what people fear. In the increasingly unlikely event that Scotland votes to leave the United Kingdom, the day after the referendum, we will find out that everything the First Minister claimed before on the currency, on pensions, on welfare, on oil revenues, on corporation tax was possibly incomplete and inconsistent. And he'll tell the nation, sorry, it was the civil servant's fault. Isn't it the case that ministers are spending their time on their separation obsession most Scots reject? And while their campaigning is failing to convince Scots, this SNP government is failing to run the country. First Minister. So, I mean, after two months of preparation, that's the exact equivalent of uh, Joanne Lamont's uh, questioning. I mean, we had last year, of course, during the summer, we ended up in climaxing with a something for nothing society. This year, it was the summer of nothing from Joanne Lamont, and certainly the rehearsing of the questions didn't uh, improve them. Uh, she says that uh, we were, I was misleading about the wholesale value of North Sea oil. The 1.5 trillion, that's a thousand billion, incidentally, is of course the estimated value of the resource over the next 40 years. But she compared it, and this is interesting, isn't it? The Better Together, Joanne Lamont and the Tories, with the Treasury paper. I've been having a wee look at the Treasury paper. It estimates the value of uh, revenues over the next 18 years. 
Now, why do the Treasury and the Labour Party tell people that there's only 18 years of Order. North Sea oil and gas production? Very interesting, that, because the Prime Minister a couple of years ago was declaring the Clarefield that was going to last until 2050. So why on earth are the Treasury talking about the next 18 years when the Prime Minister talks about Clare Ridge to 2050? The attempt by Joanne Lamont and the Tories to underestimate the value of Scotland's resources is not a recent phenomenon. It goes back to the 1970s and the 1980s. And how do we know that? Well, Dennis Healy, thankfully still alive, blew the gaff when he said there had been a deliberate underestimation of North Sea oil value in order to try and stop the Scottish Nationalists. Of course, he said it was mainly the Tories. I think it was both the Tories and the Labour Party. Yeah. Better together means very little to the people of Scotland. Question number two, Ruth Davidson. Uh, to ask the First Minister when he'll next meet the Prime Minister. First Minister. Uh, no plans, uh, immediate future. Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Last week, Audit Scotland told us that in 2011-12, Scotland's colleges were forced to cut 1,200 members of staff. It said that 48,000 student places had gone, along with 5 million teaching hours. But it didn't tell us how many college courses had been cut. Can the First Minister? First the Minister. manifesto commitment that the Scottish National Party made it was to maintain full-time uh, numbers in colleges. That's people studying full-time courses. The reason we do that is to prepare people for employment. We've met that commitment. Uh, as uh, Ruth Davidson perhaps knows, the recent statistics show a record number of Scottish students in full-time higher education. She might care... Well, we do higher education at colleges. I don't know if the Labour Party is aware of that. But that number contrasts with the nosediving figures from south of the border where the Tories are in control. That's why Scottish students are better off with the Scottish National Party and this SNP government. I'm sure that's all very comforting to the 48,000 people that have missed out, but it failed to answer the simple question that I asked him, which was how many courses have been cut from colleges across Scotland? And he clearly doesn't know, so I'll tell him. It's 614 in the last three years. 614 courses gone. And while the Education Secretary has arrogantly dismissed those cuts previously as hobby courses, they include plumbing, veterinary nursing and IT. So that is a record with fewer staff to teach, fewer hours taught, fewer students in the classroom and fewer courses to choose from. And all because Alex Salmond has raided college budgets to the tune of £34 million. Just yesterday, just yesterday, Mike Russell made the ridiculous assertion that every young person knows that progress is being made. Well, if this is progress, how bad must things get before you accept that he accepts that there's a problem? This cannot go on, presiding officer. With the budget due next week, can the First Minister confirm there will be no more cuts to our colleges? First Minister. But, Ruth Davidson seems to have forgotten the last time she read out a list of courses, it was found that some of the courses she said had ended were actually still in yeah, existence. Exactly. I, I've never known of people going back to the previous mistakes, but let's look at the exact figures. <laughs> the record high number of young people attending full-time courses at college Funded full time increased from 59,605 in 2010 11 to 61,304 in 2011 12. We've concentrated on full time college courses. We've done that because it prepares people for employment. And on any measure, whether it be funding, number of students, full time courses, investment in the capital infrastructure of colleges across Scotland, from Glasgow to Kilmarnock to Inverness to Forth Valley, the record in Scotland is inconceivably better than the record south of the border. No one could possibly, looking at the decimation 
of the colleges and universities in England under the Tory Liberal administration would want otherwise than to see our colleges or universities under Scottish control. Scottish control means a record number of full-time students. Tory control from London means a diminution of students, a diminution of prospects for young people and a policy of despair across the country. Question number three, Will Rennie. To ask the First Minister what issues will be discussed at the next meeting of the Cabinet. First Minister. I issues of importance to the people of Scotland. Will Rennie. This week, 130,000 two-year-olds have been able to go through the doors of nurseries in England to start their free education. How many two-year-olds are receiving free education in Scotland? Uh, as well as I know, we have extended to look after two-year-olds, as he also knows, we have extended to 600 hours from next year. That has moved from 412.5 hours uh, under the, uh, uh, under the Labour Liberal administration. That is for three and, and four-year-olds. I, I am sort of puzzled uh, by Willie Rennie continuing this argument, given the information that is coming to light uh, about the much-vaunted scheme south of the border. If we remember before the recess, we had a discussion at several First Minister's questions as to whether or not there was a diminution in the quality and standards and numbers of childcare provision south of the border. Willie Rennie told me that was nonsense. And then, of course, Nick Clegg made that exact issue a major of major controversy in the coalition government. And therefore, Willie Rennie should have a look at what is now being reported about the actual uptake and availability of places in England at the present moment, because many, many people are saying that because of nursery closures, there are going to be no nurseries for the people to go into. Bill um, the First Minister does not seem to recognise that the child staff ratios in Scotland are the worst on these islands. The worst on these islands, and they have been throughout the whole term of his office, the whole term of his office. He doesn't. It's surprising that he doesn't seem to know the answer as to how many are receiving free education in Scotland, because I suspect he knew I was going to ask this question. This is something that he has the powers to do today. He doesn't have to wait for independence, but he's only going to give two-year-olds what they need when he gets what he wants. The First Minister has chosen to deny children in Scotland something children in England, and the backbencher should listen, because this is something that's changing the life chances of children in England and it's been denied to those in Scotland. So will the First Minister change his mind, or is he going to continue to be the stubborn First Minister he's always been on this issue? First Minister. Well, Willie Rennie uh, denied when we had the previous discussion there was going to be a diminution of quality of standards in England. But then, of course, uh, Nick Clegg on the 5th of June confirmed that the changes to ratios for preschool children that were consulted earlier in the year will not go ahead. Why were they not going ahead if what I was warning about in terms of the English situation, why was there such an argument within the coalition government? I, I think Willie Rennie does himself less than credit not to acknowledge that 600 hours uh, from next year is a substantial achievement in the extension of provision to three and four year olds compared to the 412.5 hours uh, that we inherited. I have already told them uh, that we are extending to look after two year olds uh, as well. But what really worries me about it is after the experience that Willie Rennie had in our previous debate about whether or not there was an attempt uh, to diminish standards uh, in England, he then now is ignoring the reality which is being reported south of the border. So can I just uh, say to him that the BBC have now reported that nursery closures might not mean there will be enough places for two-year-olds promised entitlement, or to quote exactly the Chief Executive of the Family and Child Care Trust on the BBC website this week. We are concerned the loss of nursery provision in children's centres is impacting on local authorities' ability to find sufficient places for the offer. Cost saving of different nursery closures and this approach reduces capacity in the system. So Willie Rennie should have a look at what is actually happening 
under the Tory Liberal government south of the border. Because I can tell him that one thing he can be sure of in Scotland is that a commitment to 600 hours for three and four year olds, up from the 412 that we inherited, will be met, will go forward, is properly funded, and will be a substantial enhancement for childcare in Scotland. Question number four, Jimmy Day. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister, in light of it providing assistance to NGOs supporting humanitarian projects in Syria, what recent discussions the Scottish Government has had with the UK Government regarding the provision of humanitarian aid? First Minister. Well, I am sure that all members uh, share the, the concern for the millions of innocent men, women and children who have had to flee their homes as a result of the conflict in Syria. The International Development Minister, Hamza Yousaf, is in regular contact with the UK Government regarding humanitarian issues, including the situation in Syria, and is indeed due to speak with Foreign Office Minister Alistair Butt later today. Ministers will, uh, and members rather, will also be aware that in Parliament yesterday, the Education Secretary Mike Russell announced that the Scottish Government will provide a further £100,000 to the Disasters Emergency Committee appeal for Syria, bringing a contribution to £200,000 in total. The announcement was welcomed by the Disasters Emergency Committee. The funds will be spent by some of our leading agencies working in the region. They are funding food, shelter and the provision of clean water for men, women and children <coughs> fleeing the conflict. Jimmy D. Thank the First Minister for that answer and the additional funding announced by the Scottish Government. Will he join with me and the whole Chamber in expressing our solidarity with the people of Syria, one third of whom have now been displaced in this conflict? And will he do all that he can, including discuss with the UK Government, to ensure that those agencies active on the ground, such as Oxfam, are given every possible assistance to ensure that they can provide the emergency aid that is so desperately required to address what has now become a major refugee and humanitarian crisis? First Minister. Yes, I, I can give uh, uh, that commitment. And can I say that it's really important that the, after the, the vote uh, which I uh, supported in the Westminster Parliament, that the concentration uh, should come not as a political vacuum, but the concentration on reinforcing international diplomatic efforts uh, to humanitarian aid and, of course, to make sure that anybody who is uh, proven or who is accused of committing a war crime, like using poison gas in civilian populations, is arraigned as they should be before the International Criminal Court, which is an established tribunal in law which should indict suspects in that case. And these are the priorities which should be taken forward. Uh, and I'm delighted that the Scottish Government have been able to make what is a, a modest contribution compared to the scale of the issue, but nonetheless an important one to signpost the feelings of the people of Scotland uh, in helping our fellow human beings in Syria at the present moment. Lord Campbell. Uh, thank you, President. I welcome the Government's pledge to provide 100,000 of extra aid. But will the First Minister encourage the UK Government and the international community to provide support to countries such as the Lebanon and Jordan, who will be offering refuge to an estimated 3 million Syrians by the end of the year, as well as the estimated 10 million Syrians requiring aid internally? First Minister. Yes, I will. Uh, and yes, we are. And I'm sure the International Development Minister will make that uh, very point in his discussions with the UK Minister this afternoon. Question number five, James Kelly. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what the Scottish Government's position is on the statement by the Chief Executive of Homes for Scotland that the country is mired in a housing crisis. First Minister. Our position is to face up to the challenges posed by the economic downturn and Westminster's cuts to our capital budget, and unlike our predecessors, is tackling the challenges of the housing industry head on. We have achieved a 31 per cent rise in the number of social housing completions in the last six years. We are working with the private sector to bring forward a range of new initiatives to support wider housing market, including the National Housing Trust, the New Home Scheme, and we look forward to the vital £120 million shared equity scheme to start by next month. James Kelly. I thank the First Minister for that answer. Does the First Minister share the concerns of Homes for Scotland that if the current 25% uh, reduction based on last year's figures in house building continues, it will result in a shortfall of 160,000 homes by 2035. And further to the findings of the Jones Lang LaSalle report, which showed that the majority of house builders thought that independence would deliver less housing development in Scotland, will the forthcoming white paper 
consider the risks for housing of Scotland separating from the United Kingdom? First Minister. Well, the risk to housing has been the slashing of capital budgets from the United Kingdom government. And I'd have thought James Kelly, as someone who presumably cares about the housing budget, would have realised that. So it is therefore with some satisfaction, despite that range of capital cutbacks, that we can note that the rate of housing building, both in the social sector and overall in Scotland, is substantially higher than England and substantially higher than Wales at the present moment. But I agree that more must be done, and therefore the initiatives I have cited are the approach we are taking. Can James Collett, can I not understand that we have completed in five years 3,724 council homes, in the last four years of Labour administration, six were completed. Yes. When Joanne Lamont was Deputy Minister for Communities between 2004 and 2006, no council homes were built whatsoever. Or as the lost leader recently returned to the front bench put it so well in August 2008, Ian Gray said that Labour, quote, had the best homelessness legislation in the world, but we didn't build the housing to make it work. So James <laughs> Kelly will, will accept that the Scottish National Party, with our record in housing, are going to take absolutely no lectures from a Labour Party which failed in social housing and a Labour leader who didn't manage to build a single council house in the two years she was Communities Minister. Question number six. Alison Johnson. Thank you. To ask the First Minister, in light of its report, the gender impacts of welfare reform, what impacts the Scottish Government considers welfare reforms are having on women in Scotland? First Minister. Well, the publication of the report, and I'm glad to see Alison Johnson's comments in it, reflects the Government's serious concerns about the impact of the UK Government's welfare reforms on women. A single woman is predicted on average to lose 4.5 per cent of her net income due to the Coalition Government's actions. This is largely driven by the particular loss for lone parents, 90 per cent of whom are women, and who are set to lose as much as 8.5 per cent of their net income. Furthermore, the introduction of universal credit will pay benefits to households rather than individuals, which may result in a loss of financial independence for women and less money spent, therefore, on children. These so-called reforms seem to me deeply unfair. They are uncaring and they will force some of the most vulnerable households in our society to pay for the mistakes of the United Kingdom Government. Alison Johnson. Thank you. Now, we don't control welfare in Holyrood, unfortunately, so we have to mitigate these cuts in other ways. The Government has chosen to invest in construction to kickstart the economy, but there's a massive gender divide, with only 2% of construction apprenticeships going to women. The proposed extra hours of childcare are welcome, but investing in a truly transformative, affordable childcare system, looking at Nordic models, for instance, would provide hundreds of jobs and would enable thousands of women to pursue work and education, boosting the economic recovery. What will the First Minister do to ensure efforts to develop the economy are specifically designed to help women back into work? First Minister. Well, I think it's a very good question, and the, the point about modern apprenticeships uh, is one that's well made. But I know that Alison Johnson will concede that the increase in modern apprenticeships from approximately, I think, 16,000 that we inherited to over 25,000 now, there's been a disproportionate increase in the number of these modern apprenticeships going to women. Uh, and that's just very, very much to, to be welcomed, a substantially improved percentage. Now, she makes the point about construction apprenticeships, and that's a very, very fair point to make, hence the, the drive to uh, uh, attract uh, young women into not just construction, but uh, uh, across the range of, uh, of professions which previously uh, have been a, an overwhelming preserve of, uh, of males in the population. There is a substantial drive, and I know that she uh, and others uh, approved of the, the conference on women work that the Scottish Government held with the STUC and other partners, which exactly identified some of the things that we can do to uh, assist uh, in that process. But I think we should acknowledge that among the substantial, the vast increase in apprenticeships. It is particularly welcome that there has been a percentage rise in the number of women going into overall in modern apprenticeships. Jack Bailey. 
The First Minister will be aware of the Scottish Welfare Fund providing community care grants and crisis grants now devolved to Scotland and having the potential to have a very positive impact on women. Does he agree that it is a matter of concern that the fund is currently underspent by almost five times what was expected and what action will he take to ensure that women who are indeed struggling get the urgent assistance they require? You know, I, I, I've heard this during the, the, the program of government. The, the Welfare Fund is newly established. It's about to be put on a statutory footing. A commentary on the first few months as local authorities have uh, uh, accommodated and dispersed the funds and then extrapolating that on to believing there's going to be an underspend. Uh, Jackie Bailey should understand as the impact of the UK government's welfare reform or her partners in the Better Together yeah. Coalition's yeah. reforms come through, there will be many, many people in Scotland who want access to that welfare fund. And along with the action that Scotland's local authorities and government have taken to protect people from council tax benefit uh, uh, cuts, uh, along with the uh, action we've taken to reinforce the charities of Scotland so as they can cope with people in despair and distress, she truly really should bring it to herself to welcome the Welfare Fund, welcome the statutory footing that's been put on, welcome the additional funds that are going into it, and recognise that extrapolating from the first few months is not giving the real picture. The need in Scotland that's going to be caused with £270 million estimated withdrawn from the income of people in Glasgow alone is going to pose substantial challenges, and believe me, that Welfare Fund will be fully subscribed. Christina McKelvey. Much, presiding officer, given that the UK is currently the fourth most unequal country in the world, can the First Minister tell us how an independent Scotland will reverse such an iniquitous situation? First Minister. Well, we'll point uh, uh, to the uh, initiatives taken by many of our neighbours and friends in Scandinavia who have managed to build both more prosperous and more equal societies. And if we look, for example, to their transformational attitude towards childcare, we can point the forward to future social equality uh, in Scotland. But to believe Given the UK Government's track record under Labour, Conservative and Liberal coalitions yeah. over the last 25 years, that staying under the control of Westminster Government is going to do anything else than produce continuing generations of poverty and inequality in Scotland is to belie the evidence. Yeah. We don't need a crystal ball to work out the consequences of Westminster rule, we can look at the last 25 years of failure. That is why independence offers the prospect both of a most prosperous society and of a more equal country. Yeah. That ends First Minister's questions. We point of order, Mark MacDonald. Presiding officer, I'm sure the Leader of the Opposition didn't mean this, but I think she may have given an indication that the Permanent Secretary, Peter Housen, would, prevent, would present some sort of front, some sort of cover for the First Minister. And I, I do hope she takes some opportunity to make sure the official record doesn't give that impression. That's not a point of order, Ms Macdonald. We now, aim, we now move to members' business. I'm going to allow a short period of time where members can leave the chamber.